Hi, everyone. It's a, it's a small group here, but welcome everyone in, in the virtual world as well. Uh, my name is Elga Gruner. I am one of the Assistant Director of Admissions at Vermont State University. Um, you are in the Navigating the Admissions Process uh, presentation. So we will go over some of the steps and the kind of um, narrative of how to navigate the admissions uh, uh, process, applying, and everything else um, today. So uh, first of all, um, my colleague Sally is coming in later um, from the University of Vermont, but she's just a little bit talking with uh, other people currently. So um, navigating the admissions process with this presentation, uh, we will be covering um, areas uh, of like who is admissions. Um, so do we go to the next slide or? Do I do the slide? Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, got it. Can you show me how to? Sorry. It's hard, I can't see the people, so I don't know. Oh, okay, great, All right. So again, this is um, the uh, people that will be presenting for the presentation. I am Elga Gruner from Vermont State University. Um, I am based at the Williston campus, um, but we do have multiple campuses throughout Vermont as well. Um, so the presentation you're in right now is navigating the admissions process, um, basically covering um, who kind of an understanding of who is admissions, identifying your team while you're doing your admissions process, and the deadlines for different programs, um, application materials, and how to make your application strong during your application process, and also like how admissions review applications, um, and what are the time frame that you, they usually do to review the applications, and what are the decisions, and what are the decision process that we do, and what are the decision process that you do. Um, so, so this is kind of like the topics that we will be covering today at this presentation. So who is admissions? So I'm sure many of you have heard, you know, if you're searching for college, you know, uh, go to the admissions office. Who are these people? So we, admissions, we're kind of like the, the front door of any universities or, or colleges. We're here to help you. We're, we're here to kind of try to help you navigate kind of what your interests are and what you, um, you know, what questions you have regarding um, different processes to get into a college or what materials you need and things like that, depending on the different programs. Um, in addition to our admissions team, you know, some of the people that you can work with uh, to kind of go through your admissions process uh, are your family members, your friends, your school counselors, the VSAC counselor. Um, so those are kind of people in your life that you can work with. So, um, you know, your parents kind of help you navigate maybe bringing you to different colleges for college visits. Um, your school counselors maybe help you with the college, college service and college board of, you know, of finding out your interests, kind of what you like and what your strengths are uh, with the different areas of subjects that you are studying currently at high school. So, and the FESAC counselor, they have all kinds of resources that you can definitely, uh, you know, find and, and gather. And they're a great, I think up at the table, they also have resources for you that kind of gives you some charts and different things that you can use to kind of compare your schools and, and different options that you have um, for schools and majors and interests and finding that resources in uh, within your family and friends. So, um, so the admissions counselor, depending on the program you're interested in, um, I can give, for example, Vermont State University as an example. Um, some programs are offered in different campuses. Um, some campuses have 
different um, kind of requirements and prerequisites. So, so it really depends. And, you know, I'm sure it's the same for any universities. Some, some schools have different programs in different locations. So there are those type of little specific details that every school offer for students as well. So deadlines and processes. And this, is, this can get very, um, you know, um, into the grind kind of thing because there's a lot of different deadlines and different type of admissions um, for um, most schools. So these are the different type of, of basically just to kind of terminology. So early decision is basically if a college offer an early decision day, you come in or it used to be coming in person, but it's really just putting in all of your um, information, your application, uh, your supporting documentations, and you get a decision by a certain time, and that decision is binding. You have to let them know if you're coming or not, and that's binding. Um, so early action is similar to early decision, but it's not binding. So it's just a way for you to get things started early, get decisions early from the different universities that you are applying for. Um, Regular decision is just uh, pretty similar to rolling admissions. So basically, you just apply and you get a decision. You kind of take your time and make a decision accordingly whenever your family is comfortable to make that deposit. Uh, typically, the deposit deadline is May 1st for all universities. So, so that's kind of the different decisions within the admissions process. And this is... Um, a typical checklist of items that admissions require uh, for uh, uh, to apply. So uh, how many of you know of the Common App or familiar with the Common App? Have heard of the Common App? Okay, perfect, yeah. So the Common App is basically, it's just like its name. The, uh, you, you fill out one application for multiple universities or colleges and um, you can select as many schools as you want to. Um, this is when it gets kind of um, complicated for some, some students because at whatever school you choose to, sometimes they have additional requirements that they want you to have. Um, we call that supplemental forms. Um, so make sure that you do complete that supplemental forms for all the schools that you have selected on the Common App. And every school typically also have an application fee. So, you know, if, if I was a student, I would not apply more than five to 10 schools in the Common App because it does add up with the application fee and the, all the different paperwork that each school might be required you to have. Um, but that's, that's the nice thing about the Common App is that you just fill out one application for all the different schools. So the application fee is, is a very typical thing that every school of, uh, required students to have. Sometimes schools have an application fee waiver. Sometimes it's a code. Uh, sometimes it's just visiting a campus and you get a fee waiver or something for visiting. So it's, it's worth asking an admissions counselor what, if they offer an application fee waiver or not uh, because it does add up. I'm not sure about UVM, but Vermont State University application fee is $45. So, it, you know, if every school you have to pay is $45, 10 schools is $450. So it's nice to be able to have that waiver if you can get, get one. Um, official transcripts. Um, so if you're a high school student, this is your high school transcript. If you have taken early college or or um, dual enrollment or any kind of college courses, we, we require the college transcripts as well. Um, so that's, um, that's kind of part of the admissions requirement if, if, you if you're uh, those students. If you're a transfer student, we do also need all of the uh, tr college transcripts from all of the previously attended universities and colleges. So, so we do have, uh, we need to have that as part of your admissions process. And this, the test scores and recommendations, depending on the schools and the programs, some, some schools require test scores like SAT, ACT uh, test scores. Um, so that is something that you have to kind of investigate for each school. Uh, Vermont State University is a test optional school. Um, 
I'm not sure about UVM, um, test optional school as well. So, so that's, you know, basically what, what it means is that you don't have to uh, submit your, your SAT test score. Um, the recommendations, depending on the program, some programs require a letter of recommendations, some programs don't require a letter of recommendations. And so, so that's also, um, yep. Um, it depends on the, I think if you, it depends on the school that you're applying for. If you take it at, uh, for Vermont State University, some programs require a letter of recommendation, some don't. So our liberal arts program, we do not require a letter of recommendations. But if you're applying to nursing or engineering, we do require a letter of recommendations, yeah. Um, essay, it's just our way, a lot of universities now don't require an interview, so it's our way of getting to know you. So. Um, for our university, we want to get to know you more while we're reviewing your application. We want to, we, cut, we review application holistically, so we read everything, letter of recommendations, essay. Um, so it's good kind of for you to let us know who you are, what your interest is, and why you want to study this, and you know, if, it's just really nice to kind of hear your voice a little bit. Um, Resume extracurricular activities, that's also good for us to know. It does make a difference um, in kind of make your application look a little bit uh, different and more stand out <laughs> compared to the other people. So, and this is when I turn the table over to Sally from UVM. Thank you, Elga. Well, hello, everyone. Nice to see some of you. I think I've seen you since this morning for our information session. So really great to be here um, and continue the conversation about the admissions process. So um, in terms of compiling your application, <clears throat> we look at applications holistically. So we look at many, many factors in the admissions process. Um, Elga had already talked about the Common App. I think we've already talked about everything on this slide, right? So I'm going to forward that one. So how to enhance your application? Uh, we've spent a lot of time over the last few months reading applications at UVM and um, really happy that most of our decisions are all released right now for first year applicants. We have transfer students who are beginning to apply. Um, so I can speak well to what we look at and the, the eye strain. I've been in admissions a long time. I wear a lot of glasses um, to read those applications and the essays. And I can't impress upon you enough how important it is that you spend some time and you're really thoughtful about your course selection. Um, I can't repeat it enough. Course selection really matters. Um, it does a number of things. First, it's really good preparation for your majors. Um, college will be so much easier and a smoother process in terms of transitioning from high school to college if you've had, you know, advanced courses, honors courses, a lot of, you know, reading and writing. Um, so I can't impress upon you how important it is to have what we call a college prep track of courses. Um, we have what's called entrance requirements. Um, and most schools list either uh, entrance requirements, recommended courses, um, and they may have so many years of English, so many years of social sciences, so many years of math, so many years of science, so many years of a foreign language. And I can't tell you how many students say, well, I'm in Algebra two right now, I'm gonna stop, you know, because I'm done. I'm like, no, like, continue on, because it'll be better for you to continue with those subject areas because if you stop then college can be kind of a rude awakening when maybe you're playing catch up because you didn't take that fourth year of math or you didn't take an advanced science. So those advanced courses really help prepare you. So feel free to stretch a little bit. Uh, we feel a huge obligation to Vermonters, really help to provide access. We visit every high school in the state um, at least once, if not multiple times, and um, can't impress upon folks enough about the course selection. Um, sometimes it's a real challenge that maybe it doesn't fit into your schedule or maybe um, the school is having trouble finding a teacher in that one area. There's a lot of options. There's a lot of online classes, which is not the best environment for some students. Um, the dual enrollment is a really great option to enhance your academic 
strengths, your academic portfolio, and many of those classes are in person. And then there's also vouchers for the summer. So talk to your schools about early college, dual enrollment. We're seeing more and more students coming in with a lot of credit, and it can really shave off a number of um, courses that you might need um, to take at the college level to either graduate early or to perhaps do an advanced um, sort of an accelerated master's program. So course selection really matters. If you're interested in an engineering field, if you're interested in our Grossman School of Business, um, those are all topics and areas of study that require a lot of math, more than I think sometimes students realize. So math is really a life skill as well. And for some students, math may not be you know, your strong suit. Um, so stretch a little bit, maybe out of maybe an area that's comfortable for you. In the admissions process, we're not always looking for, you know, straight A grades, because that's just not the case for many students. But we do notice trends in grades, course selection, um, and what teachers have to say about you. So letters of recommendation, um, talking about a student who has worked really hard in a class that was hard for them, that was out of their comfort zone, you know, do you go in for extra help? Do you, you know, take advantage of, you know, whatever it is that the school might provide as far as resources? That tells us a lot about you as a learner, how much you'll dig in, how much you'll put in effort. Um, and those are things that really help to predict your success in college, in life, is that ability to be resilient, to bounce back, to work through difficult situations. So even though a course may not be maybe top of your list to take, we really look for that well-rounded academic schedule. Because we know at the college level, there's going to be requirements in a variety of areas. We have what's called the um, Catamount Core, which are courses that all students are required to take. So we really like to see kind of five academic courses or um, major you know, sort of courses every year. There's some really awesome electives. There's some really wonderful uh, math classes that have to do more with math literacy, which I think are really important <laughs> life skills. But we really would like to see a student take a pre-calculus and maybe the, you know, the financial math class. But if you had to choose, go with like a pre-calculus or a stats or something like that, especially for someone who's looking at engineering or business because they do have a really strong math preparation. Um, our sciences you know, really are looking for math and advanced sciences as well. So in the catalogs and in all the information that you might see online or that are mailed to you, you know, look at those required courses because uh, they, they really matter. You know, we're seeing you know, trends in academic performance as something that we spend a lot of time in. You know, we see many students who are growing students, emerging students, and the junior year is the year that we see the full academic work when a student applies. So that is a really important year for us to see um, how you're doing. So there are times when the admissions committee might read an application and want to wait and defer that decision until we get your semester grades maybe from your senior year. So keep that in mind, that your senior year can really help augment and enhance your application. But that junior year, for those of you who are planning kind of your schedule for next year um, is really an important year. So those are things that we look at. The essay is another big part of the admissions process. Um, I personally love the essay. I like to read it first in many ways. I feel it's kind of the soul of the application. It tells us who you are, what's important to you. Um, it's a really, really important piece that we, we read about and you know, we can tell something about the student. So um, my colleague will be doing a, a workshop on the essay writing, which is really a great workshop. I'd recommend that you, you go, because I think some students really miss the mark and don't capitalize on the essay. We read every application. You know, many get read multiple times. And so have that essay really be your voice, be a vehicle where we can read that and have a better sense of who you are, what's important to you. You know, pick a moment, pick a day, pick a time. I think some students try to put it all into an essay, and it just doesn't really work that well. So essays matter in that they tell us things about you, but they're also a writing sample. So there are times when maybe we see some lower English grades. Reading the essay is really revealing. So we take a look at that. We also take a look at other prompts and questions in the application. So my advice to you, 
is if there are additional essay prompts, do them. Like capitalize on all the, all the levers, all the things in an application that will help you stand out. Um, don't leave anything on the table. So some of them may be optional, but it's, it's really good to do them as well. Um, recommendations. We see recommendations from a whole range of people. Um, sometimes we see recommendations from a babysitter, which is really neat, you know, about the family and how you were a babysitter and what that meant to the family. Sometimes we see them from employers. Sometimes we see them from coaches. We most commonly see them from a teacher, someone who knows you well in class. Um, and I love reading the essays or the recommendations from recommenders who talk about you in their class and that maybe you know, English is really a hard subject for you and how you've worked really hard on your writing and you've continued to hone it and you go in for extra help or you do multiple, you know, edits of your, of your essays. So I like to read recommenders who talk about growth, to, who talk about strength. So you don't always have to ask a teacher who knows you from class because you did really well. It's okay to also have a recommender be someone who knows how you've put in the effort? Have you persisted? Because um, that tells us a lot about your character. Um, other um, recommenders, sometimes employers, um, it's okay to have a few send a recommendation in. Um, they send them in through a variety of ways. We get most things now electronically. I've been in the office a long time, you know, Used to be, you used a typewriter, right? Anyone remember a typewriter? Um, to fill out an application. Then it moved to online. Um, and now really everything, I'd say 90% of our documents come, if not more, electronically. So they get to us quickly. Just make sure that they put your full name and your address or a birthday or some way that we can match them up um, correctly. So those are some examples of recommendations. Ask them in advance. If you have a deadline of November 1st, like don't be asking them on October 31st. Give them some runway, and they'll be able to provide, I think, a much deeper, much more meaningful letter of recommendation. Um, not everything has to be on file at the same time, typically. Um, we have sort of completion deadlines within like a few weeks of when our application deadline is. So if we get something in ahead of that application, we just you know, keep it on file, and then when your application comes in, we'll make sure you know, Jimmy Smith, imagine how many we have of them, go into the right application with the right address, the right birthday. So it kind of is a shell, and then we add the documents in as we get them. So recommendations can help move a decision you know, from one type of decision to another. They're often not a big driver in the process, but they have some subtle um, roles as far as telling us more about you. Connect and visit. Um, Elga talked a little bit about this, and you know it's really important to read your email. Uh, that is the major vehicle of how colleges communicate. Um, sometimes we send messages to parents once we get parent emails, which can be really helpful as well. But there are important emails that if you're not checking and reading, you could miss out on things. Um, so there are times when we'll reach out to find out about an interest area. There's times that we might reach out to see if you have other major choices. If there's something in your application we really want to offer you admission, but maybe your first choice major is oversubscribed or we don't think you have the requirements, but we really can see you in another major, um, there's a lot of opportunities there. So emails are a major vehicle. Uh, we also keep track of how we meet students. And we really want to be able to admit a student who really wants to be at our school. Um, and that's really true of, of schools all over the country who wouldn't want a student who is super enthusiastic about that institution. Um, so we keep track of, do you open email? Do you, um, you know, respond to anything we send? Did you go to a college fair? Did we meet you at your high school? Um, we have lots of virtual programming, which is a great way to you know, augment our applicant pool and provide information. Um, you don't have to travel. You, know, you just have to tune in right, by hitting that link. And so there's a lot of ways that you can show another school of your interest. And that's by doing a virtual program, visiting on campus, um, reaching out to your counselor. I cover the state of Maine, and I cover uh, a lot of areas in Vermont. Um, I love it when students email me and tell me like, hey, I visited last week, I loved it. Can you tell me about X major? Or 
you know, I live too far away or I can't make it to campus, but can you connect me with a professor and with a student in our animal science major? So it's a way you can introduce yourself to a school. So almost every school in the country will have a kind of a contact us and they might have a map or they'll have a link, depending on where you're from, a contact person. So if you live in the state of Maine, if you, you'll look at the map and um, the listing on our website and you'll see my name and then you just click on my email and then you can introduce yourself. So don't be shy. I think this is the message I want you to hear now. Let the school know that you're looking, that you're planning a visit or you just want more information because that helps us get a sense in our applicant pool you know, who are really interested um, and that can help us in making our decisions, especially when Decisions are um, selective or a major is really competitive. Those are ways that you can just enhance your chances and also just find out a lot more about the school and about the major. You know, how fast did a school reply? Like, is that indicative of the type of experience that I'm going to have? You know, if nobody replies to your emails or your phone calls, you know, do you want to go to that school? I mean, so it kind of works both ways that you get to know kind of about the responsiveness of that school as well. So visiting can be really important. We see students visit campus at all different times. Um, you don't have to visit during the application cycle. Some students wait and hear back their admissions decisions and then decide, okay, now I'm gonna make that trip to X or Y. Or maybe I'm just so busy, like you can't really fit it in because of your sports season or your drama you know, production dates. Um, and you're gonna wait and see if you're admitted or not. And that's totally fine. We have admissions events throughout the academic year. And we have some that are just for admitted students. So that's probably like the, the enchilada, right? It's the really big, nice visit where you get a lot of interaction with faculty. You have time to be in the dining halls. You get to talk to current students. You know, orientation folks are there, study abroad. So there's a lot of information that we provide really only for an admitted student for a visit. So that's something just to be aware of about visit programs. Um, last on this list is a portfolio or an audition. Um, and some schools have what's called an interview or whatnot. We have chats. They're informal. They're not a requirement. Um, we don't really put weight in the admissions process in them because we're not able to interview everyone. So we, we try to really keep the playing field pretty even. In some of our majors, um, in particular music, there are certain majors that require an audition. So read through the information on the schools that you're looking at to see if, do they require an audition for certain majors? Do they require a portfolio for art? Um, some have alumni who interview or have conversations in this area, um, which is really a neat way to connect with a school through an alumni representative. So they vary, and oftentimes the alumni will send a report to the school just acknowledging, you know, I met with Susie on this date, you know, she's interested in this major, we talked about X and Y. Um, so it's just another, another way you can express your interest in a school uh, and not travel there. So there's a difference between capable and competitive, and I want to talk a little bit about this. There are many schools in the country that are highly, highly selective. They get a lot of press. They're in the news a lot. Um, they're admitting less than 10, less than 5% of their applicant pool. That is really not the norm. You know, in general, hundreds and hundreds of colleges are admitting, you know, 50, 60 percent or more of their applicant pool. So I think, you know, the media can like portray the admissions process something really scary, really, really difficult, and it doesn't have to be that hard. Um, so I think working with your school counselors, looking at the materials online, looking at a whole number of, you know, guidebooks and websites can give you some intel as to, you know, how selective a school might be. If you're looking at University of Vermont, we're a moderately selective school. We really bend over backwards for our Vermonters. We really want to help Vermonters come to UVM. That doesn't mean we admit 100%, but we admit a high percentage, like six or seven out of 10, I would say, um, for most majors. And there are other schools where they might admit one out of 10. So I think take it all with a grain of salt. You know, if you're applying to highly selective schools, 
the bulk of that application, you know, that applicant pool is going to be extremely talented, very, very, you know, high GPAs, extraordinary experiences, um, and to keep a pretty good list of schools if you're applying to highly selective schools, because this is very unpredictable. Um, so that's kind of the difference between capable, are you, you know, when we read an application, we ask ourselves, especially a Vermonter, you know, can this student be successful? Do we think they're likely to succeed academically at UVM? So um, those are some questions that we ask, and we look for reasons to admit students. Uh, contrary to what the media might portray, uh, many colleges are looking for that, looking for a fit, looking for students who really want that institution. Um, you know, when I read an application too, I wonder like, what type of roommate would this person be? You know, we want to build our community. Um, so those are ways that you can illustrate what you'll bring to, a, to that campus. The holistic review I mentioned, that we look at the whole applicant, many, many factors in the admissions process, not one thing, you know, not that one low grade is gonna keep you out, for instance. We're looking for, you know, many factors, upward trends, junior year I've mentioned, um, the rigor of the class schedule, um, all those things I think I, I've talked about and um, hopefully you've heard. Um, your story, again, really important. We wanna know your experiences, your, your life journey to this point, um, all those factors really matter. Um, there are a lot of decisions that admissions offices make. Uh, we admit many students, as I said. Um, there are times when we might look at the second choice, and again, that comes into like reading those emails that we send because there's a lot of things that we communicate about. Visit options, deadlines, advice on how you write an essay. Um, how are you doing? You know, we'll send information around the deadline, like breathe, like it's gonna be okay. Here are some tips that will help you. Um, we do what's called a wait list for many of our majors. And a waiting list decision does not necessarily mean it won't happen. It's basically a maybe. You know, it's something that you can't count on necessarily. But what happens is it's kind of hard to predict enrollments, especially for some majors. So sometimes we have, and many times, in certain majors, just an abundance of riches, right? Many, many applicants, very solid academically, very similar academically, and if we're worried that we may be over enrolling, we'll put a student on a wait list. We communicate that out, that you're on the waiting list, and we ask you, if you're on the waiting list, to let us know if you're interested. So if we wait list, say, 5,000 people, how many do you think say on the wait list? Any guesses? A third? 80%? Less than half. So sometimes the wait list, you think like, oh, it's gonna be this huge list. Um, it's worth staying on the wait list. And we take a look at our enrollments as they come in, because we have students you know, respond by a certain date. It's usually May 1st. If we're coming up a little short, we might reach out to that student who's on the waiting list, who's written to us, who said, I would give my eye teeth to come to UVM. This is why, this is what I want to do. When we go to that wait list, if we have some room, guess who we're going to take? Someone who made some noise, right? Someone who's told us they really want to be here. If there's radio silence and the student never writes to us, never reaches out, our assumption is you're not interested, which is okay. But if you want to go to a school, like, don't be shy. Write to the school, accept the wait list. And if we do go to the waiting list, we often will email, call, text, but often email is that vehicle. So that's a little bit about the wait list. If you have questions afterward, I'm happy to chat about that, but that is what a lot of schools use to kind of enroll the class size that they want to so they don't over-enroll, okay? So it's, it's kind of, in many cases, like for the school's benefit, but if you really want to be at the school, you know, my niece got into a school, um, dream school on a wait list, like in July, you know, for physician assistants. She changed her whole plan um, late, but she knew that she really wanted to go to that school and she was offered, a, you know, a position off the wait list. Denies, it's not fun to get a deny letter, but it's good information. We try to release our decisions earlier 
um, in plenty of time so that you can apply to other schools because there's a lot of schools, there's some great options out there. And sometimes the denies are like a blessing in disguise that things, things have a way of working out. Um, so the deny decision is something that we send and almost all decisions nowadays are online. Very few schools actually send letters. You might get a PDF of that letter and you can print it out frame it, put it on your wall, put it under your pillow, whatever you want to do. Um, but it's no longer like going down to the mailbox to find that letter like it used to be at one time. Um, so that's, I think most of them, a defer. Let's talk a little about the defer decision. The defer is a maybe. So a defer is basically your decision is pending. If you apply early, early action, Vermonters can apply for free. We waive the $55 application fee. You might get what's called a deferral, which basically says, you know, thank you for applying. We were conservative in our admit offers. We're going to wait and we're going to look at new grades, more information, and we're going to render a decision later next semester. So what that is a good indication of is keep your grades up, work hard, request that your school send us another set of grades from like the semester mark. We often will see first quarter on your transcript, but seeing the semester grades can really help. You've applied to the business school. We were wondering about your math. Look at that. They came through with a B plus in pre-calc. That will help us with maybe making an admissions decision. Um, seeing the rest of the applicant pool, seeing you, know, you maybe write um, a letter to us. And there's the capability in many platforms where if you're deferred or an applicant, you can actually upload information right into your file. Um, so that's helpful. So if a student was deferred, we might wait and see, you know, what has the student done since we deferred them in December? So defers, in many cases, become admits later on. So don't lose heart. Don't get discouraged if you get a deferral. It doesn't mean it's going to be a deny. Um, and there's other decisions that schools make, but conditional and provisional are kind of unusual. So that, I think, is um, what I want to cover about decisions. The deadline, everything typically moves forward till what's called the common reply date, which is the 1st of May. So this is where, like, I think the beauty is in the process. You're waiting and waiting and waiting to hear back from the colleges on whether or not we make an offer of admission. But then, once that offer is released, guess what? We're waiting and wondering what you're going to do. And are we going to meet our enrollment goals? Um, or do we need to go to the waiting list? So there's some beauty in that, that you are then in the driver's seat to decide on the school. And there's a deadline that all colleges are agreeing to follow, which is you should have information about your admission, your merit scholarship, a financial aid award in hand to make a decision by the 1st of May. So that's the normal process. This year, there's conversations about schools extending that deadline because of some challenges with the federal financial aid process. Um, so that could be a conversation for another whole workshop. Uh, but typically, in a normal year, the deadline is May 1st. Anytime a deadline is published, um, you don't want to miss it. Because if you miss a deadline, they may or may not take like that basically deposit or that acceptance fee. Um, so it's important just to kind of have a calendar of things. There's other deadlines about financial aid and application completing. So I think just keeping deadlines on a calendar is always a good thing. Well, I think I've talked too much. Um, questions that you may have. Yeah. You might have said this, but um, what's the typical time frame when offers are sent out? I'm trying to figure out what's the, what's the yeah. time of offer to that May 1st. Yeah, it's a great question. So the question was about the timing of the offers. Um, every school is different. This year, just I can speak to UVM, we released our decisions um, like the third week of December. And we released them in bulk. Um, and then we released them kind of every week um, for a short period of time. And then we don't release again until um, March. So we just released on March 8th. Can't remember the date now. Um, and then they kind of dribble out after that um, a little bit. Um, but some schools vary. Like, for instance, what, is, um, what does so your school do? For Vermont State University, most of our programs are rolling admissions. So we make decisions as soon as your file is complete. 
um, typically like two weeks from when your file is complete. Complete meaning we have all of the documentations we need with your application, um, and then not when you submit the application. Um, so that's, but for some programs, um, they do have the early admissions deadline. Um, we usually have those decisions out in February. Great, yeah. Oh, I think she wants you to use the mic. How about that? Just so the uh, people online can hear the yeah. questions. They can't hear. Oh, so okay. okay. Yeah. So I had a question about um, waitlisted timing. So if if the decision is May first, is there like a a time frame for a waitlisted individual? There is. That's a great question. So question about the timing. Um, it's kind of like reading the tea leaves, right? Enrollment managers kind of look at the enrollment data to see how many students are saying yes. If a certain major or college within maybe the university looks like their enrollments are coming up a little shorter than they expected, um, usually it's like around the third week of April, like a week before or a week to 10 days before the deadline of May 1st or deadline du jour, will identify some students and we'll reach out and offer them a position off the wait list and then send information, the admissions decision, and then have, usually the deadline remains the same, May 1st, but there are times when it's leading up to, it's after May 1 or just before, which is when it can be tricky, right? Because schools require a deposit. Many of them it's non-refundable, so sometimes you have to be willing to like lose a deposit. Um, some schools are more generous than others in refunding it. Um, but that's why, again, it gets back to reading your email and checking your phone. Like, please set up a message, like a voicemail, because so many times we'll call and the phone is not set up for messages and then we may email. But there are times when you just, you know, we miss out, we move quickly. Um, so it's a great question about wait list and timing. Okay. Okay, let's go with these in the back. Thank you. Um, I just wondered for admissions, um, what schools are looking for now as far as extracurricular activities? Are they looking more for quality versus quantity now, or what's the guidelines around that? Yeah, it's a great question about extracurricular activities. Um, I'll say a little bit, and then maybe Elga, you can chime in. We're not looking for, like, war and peace. We're not looking for, you know, 30 different things that you're involved in. Um, I think just list things that you've been active in, things that really matter to you. We look at, like, the length of time you've been involved in an activity. You know, if you become active in things all your senior year, you know, that doesn't show us a lot of depth of commitment to that activity. You might be doing dance for, you know, the last 10 years and you do it to the nth degree or maybe you do a sport, but we do look at what you're involved in. We also look if you work after school. We have a lot of students who are working a lot of hours after school. You're helping with care of another family member. So tell us about yourself. How does VSU um, look. Yeah, it, it's basically pretty similar. Uh, we, we, we don't want you to kill yourself and have 50 different activities while you're in high school. I think um, for most admissions, college uh, class selection is um, important. The activities could affect the, des the decisions. Um, and I think finding what you are really good at and really stick with it is, is more important than having five 50 different uh, activities um, and, and not do well in, in school. So not sure if that answers the question. Thank you. Yeah. Balance. I, have a, I do have some questions online if I might jump in with one. Sure, why don't you give us one of them. Um, we have, um, as a homeschooler, what should I know about the process of admissions and I want to do early enrollment at 14 or 15? Mm, awesome. Go ahead, Elva. <laughs> That, that's a, I can piggyback that, on that. That is a, um, um, can you repeat that question again? Um, yes, yes, this is a homeschool. Okay. Um, what should I know about this process? I would like to do early enrollment at 14 or 15. Um, so the process of admissions would be the same. Um, for homeschool students, uh, we would want the official transcript 
uh, from some sort of homeschool organizations. They usually have uh, an official transcript. So we we just we would have the same process for for admissions. Um, it can be tricky with housing um, if they need to live on campus. Uh, so that's uh, you know. That's, that can get pretty involved with student life and dean of students on that. But the admissions process is, is pretty much the same. How about you, Sally? Yeah, homeschooled applicants are really interesting, and um, that sounds really exciting, the plan. Uh, we look at the homeschool transcript that's provided, and then you know many homeschoolers leverage so many opportunities to take classes. So we'll be looking at all the work that they may have done through X school or Y school. Living on campus is, is different, you know, if you're a non-degree student versus a degree student. So I think the best advice is, you know, contact the school and we can talk about those particular details if you want to actually, like, be a matriculated student early. Was there a question in the back? I don't want to miss anybody back there. I'm like, well, you're, like, I have, like, two questions, but, like, when you're, like, well, once... Will one grade dictate if you can get to the college or not? And like your semester grade, and does colleges look on more grades or like personality and who you are as a person? Like so really great question. Um, no, typically one grade is not going to predict your decision. Um, there's certain required courses though, you know, that if you have not passed, you know, <coughs> A math class or a science class like if you don't meet the minimum requirements that can be a problem um, we also see students who have taken a class again done really really well maybe there was personal circumstances going on when you took that class in 10th grade and you retook that class over the summer or the next year and really did well so we take account into all those things and we care deeply about the person the fit for the major, you know, the, the, the human being behind that application. There are times when if a decision is kind of borderline, we tend to want to tip our hat to a student who's really worked hard, who we think will be successful. So those are all, again, pieces in the application that you can convey that information to us. And there's a lot of steps along the way. Some students are not admitted right away but they gain admission through articulations we have with other schools, like the Community College of Vermont. There's a clear pathway. So there's always, you know, that, that old expression, that where there's a will, there's a way, as my grandmother used to say. So we work with students on creating a pathway. Great question. Well, I think we're out of time, aren't we? I think we're pretty close. Another question online? I had a couple more. Um, okay. Actually, I had one. One about um, dual enrollment. Um, if a student has dual enrollment um, courses, do they, uh, I'm, I'm going to assume this means early college, when they come in with their associate's degree, are they accepted as a college student or a high school student? It's a great question. It may be different, so why don't you um, respond? So are they getting the associate's degree while they're in high school? Um, is that what, okay, because I know some states have that. I know New York is one um, that I'm very familiar with. Um, for Vermont State University, we would still treat them as a first year student with college credits. Uh, so it really depends on the schools. So we would evaluate the college courses individually. The registrar's office does that upon acceptance. Does that answer the question? Yeah, we get students who get hung up on that. I'm really glad that they brought that question up. Thank you. There are times when we don't know that you're in dual enrollment. Sometimes that's not on the application. You didn't fill that out. Or, um, you know, we really would like to see the fall, like fall semester of grades at that school where you're doing dual enrollment. The high school doesn't have that information in some cases. So, um, it's helpful to get the transcript sent directly from that college to the school um, so that we can see official transcript of that work. Um, and students also get hung up on are they a first year applicant or a transfer applicant? And we define a transfer student as a student who has taken college courses after high school graduation. So someone who is doing their senior year as an early college student at X or Y school we view still as a first year applicant and there's different deadlines if you're a first year student versus a transfer so they can get hung up on that great question can i ask one more online 
Sure. <laughs> um, so I have a, um, someone on Zoom who says, I go to a career center and my classes are very different than they would be in a typical school situation. Do career center applications tend to stand out or are they normally not accepted? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. They are different types of classes, different types of instruction. Uh, I think it depends. If the student is excelling in those programs, is meeting or exceeding our entrance requirements, you know, we admit a good number of students at the Career Center. I can think of a number of majors where we see them tend to fall, and that would be in the health science areas or in engineering. You know, our Dean of Engineering, Linda Shadler, loves kids through the Tech Center. She says they are hands-on, they're really great problem solvers, uh, but again, you need to have some of the requisite coursework in, you have to have physics, you have to have pre-calculus, you need to have chemistry. So if you can combine those things and some of those credits are embedded, um, you'll, do, you'll do really well. I, I, I agree with that, yeah, the same. All righty. Well, we'll be around for questions at the end, and I think we have another set of workshops that we need to get to. But thank you for being kind of here through the snow, and have a great afternoon, and there's uh, another workshop coming up. Thank you.